Hello and welcome to this the third event in our series of Cambridge Conversations, which seeks to bring you, our distinguished alumni all over the world, the latest Cambridge thinking on COVID-19 and its implications for us, our families and communities. My name is Madeleine Atkins. I am the president of Lewis Cavendish College, and I'm delighted to be moderating this particular event this afternoon. I spent all my professional life in education with a particular interest in new technologies and how they can enrich and really uh, enhance the learning of students and pupils. I'd like to introduce our two expert speakers, Dr. James Bidolf, the head teacher of the groundbreaking Cambridge University Primary School, which is uh, up at Eddington or Northwest Cambridge, as some of you may remember it, and also Dr. Ems Lord, who is a member of the Faculty of Education here at the university, is a research fellow at Clare Hall, but to the point of the event this afternoon, is director of Enrich, probably the largest program in the world for mathematical outreach education, and certainly the best. Now, in addition to listening to our expert speakers, we very much hope that we will hear from you. At the bottom of your screen, there should be a rectangular box marked Q&A. And if you click on that, you should be able to type a question that we will then see and be able to answer, or to put at least, to our expert panel. We have about 30 minutes of Q&A time. I hope that we can uh, do justice to a large number of your questions, but I'm sure you'll forgive us if we don't have time for them all. Just one reminder before we get going, this event is being recorded and will be shown through YouTube next week, complete with the presentations. So, what is schooling for? COVID-19 has raised a number of questions about schooling at home, its benefits and disbenefits, and also what it is that the community of a school can do and achieve in learning, which perhaps homeschooling cannot. We know that COVID-19 has raised questions about the purpose and design of traditional office workspaces, for example. Is this the moment we should also be asking about the physical nature and environment and design of school? So time, I think, to listen to our two speakers. First, Dr. James Bidolf, as I said, the head teacher of our fantastic primary school in the University of Cambridge. Just after qualifying, uh, Dr. Bidolf uh, received the award of the most outstanding young teacher of the year in London. But he's also taught in primary and secondary schools in Nepal and India. He has been the inaugurating uh, head teacher of a Hindu based primary school, and he's in his spare time turned around a couple of failing schools in East London. And we are delighted that he is the head teacher of our outstanding primary school up at Eddington. And then Dr. Ems Lord, she is the immediate past president of the Mathematical Association and a member of the very prestigious National Joint Mathematical Council. As I said at the beginning, she is the director of Enrich, and both she and James were founding fellows of the Chartered Institute for Teaching, which is the professional body for professional teachers in this country. So without further ado, I'd like to turn to James for his presentation. James, over to you. Thank you, Madeleine. Um, good afternoon to you all, and I hope you are all well wherever you are. Um, as Madeleine said, I'm talking from my office in, at school in Cambridge, and it's, it's very eerily quiet at the moment, even though we have never really shut, but um, we have fewer children than normal. Um, so the question is very uh, important for us at the moment, and in my short presentation, I'll touch upon some of the thoughts gathered um, through our experience, but also through conversations with educators in my team and children. Um, the next slide will, will you'll see that um, I'm normally used to reading stories to young children. Um, and as I said, a school without children is an eerie place to be. 
And this whole period in our collective history has prompted many questions about the purpose of education, of life, of death, of politics, of histories, of inequalities and social justice. Um, and this brilliant book by Charles Anacasey called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox and the Horse, um, which our children love very much, it's, got, it's full of messages to invite us to rethink, remember and unlearn so that we can see the world afresh again. Um, and we at UCPS, at the University of Cambridge Primary School, have often engaged in dialogue about such questions. And at this vital time, to ask more questions, is it the time to do some unlearning? Changing what we thought we knew about education, learning to be different, to think differently, maybe to explore new possibilities that were unshackled by the often restrictive narrow policy definitions of education. So I wonder now, is this disruptive pandemic prompting us to reconsider not only what school is and what it's not, but also what education is? And when is education not education fit for the time and for the people it serves? It's required us at this moment to be experimenters and possibility thinkers. If you look at um, the next slide, um, the question, when is a school? This is our school, it's a beautiful design. Um, as a noun, if you think of what is a school as a noun, uh, the, thought, the first thought is it's a physical space. It becomes a place for learning. Somewhere where children go, where educators go to, to engage in teaching and learning. It's a place where parents put their trust in us, um, teachers, teaching assistants, school administrators, to, su to support them, to, put, to support us to create memorable experiences for children. So perhaps it's a rudimentary response, when is a school not a school? Well, a school is not a school when the people who go there for this purpose are no longer going there, as it is at the moment. There seems a loss, increasing feeling of disconnection, despite the efforts that educators are making to provide learning opportunities at home. If we consider it as a verb, to be schooled, or the notion of children schooling, the whole notion of schooling seems to have a limited view about the engagement between educator and learner, as one about instruction, or passing on information, or delivery of a curriculum a more didactic conceptualization of what happens in a school. So if you, the, the, the next slide you'll see a picture of our school. This is what no, it normally looks like for us. It's full of children. We have about 500 children here at the moment. Um, we engage in habits of mind, helping children become independent learners, the ability to think and consider ideas by developing oracy and dialogue. And importantly, to, to develop opportunities to play and inquire and imagine and create. But what school looks like is in the next slide. Our teachers are in boxes on a screen, trying to create the same meaning, sense of community and challenge and support that we can do when the children are with us. And at this time of lockdown, it's left for parents to navigate and translate for us, for their children. And this huge pressure and anxiety and the sheer overwhelming feeling of inadequacy has arisen. Um, even teachers at home are saying that it's a struggle to teach their own children. And they have the pedagogic knowledge uh, that many parents wouldn't have. It raises questions about what parents and wider society think about what happens in school. It's not just a transaction of knowledge, it's something much more. We don't know the answers yet, um, but you know, we're asking the questions. You may, you may have heard of the Cambridge Primary Review in the next slide, um, the biggest piece of academic research into primary education since the 60s. Um, and there are three recurring concerns that they identified. This notion of childhood as being in crisis, how do we understand childhood better? whether society in the wider world is an anxiety and disempowerment, and how do we empower that in schools, and whether policymakers are providing solutions or problems, and this seems most relevant now. In slide seven, we're living through a monumental moment um, in history. Maybe you go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, Isaac, in 1665, social distancing orders um, were made in Cambridge because of the bubonic plague killing 100,000 people. Um, Isaac Newton had to leave Cambridge at 24, uh, forced to, to live in his childhood home. Um, but he said that freed from the limits of the Cambridge curriculum, Newton found that he had the breathing space to reflect and develop on the theories that uh, he then eventually created in optics and calculus, the laws of motion and gravity. He described this as the most productive time of his life. So when is a school a school in COVID-19 and a post-COVID-19 world? A school is a source, a fountain of expertise to facilitate exploration and learning. And how in this moment, when homes are now the space for that learning, can parents be supported by teachers to facilitate the learning, as well as doing their own work and trying to manage their own lives? It's an enormous task, 
but I think we'll look back and, and understand the rich learning that, we, that we're having. Because it's at home, they haven't got the same structures and routines and expectations or dynamics that we have in school, nor do they have the pedagogic knowledge and understanding. So this global pandemic seems to have forced change in schools. Such a dramatic shock um, has left parents reeling, as well as teachers trying to do their best if they have resources and unable to if they don't. Um, but there are inequalities that are growing. And you know, as a head teacher, I'm, I'm increasingly concerned. And of course, we must remember there are hundreds of thousands of children who don't even know what a school is, let alone have a sense of loss about not going there. So like Newton, has COVID-19 provided the catalyst to consider what a wholesome education is for the most valuable source in our, in our world, our children, for all our children everywhere? Is this our gravity moment? I asked one of our children in our school, his name is Shane, he's a, an advocate, a speaker, and a visionary. He's only nine years old. And he said, we shouldn't ask a school, when is a school not a school? He, we should ask, when is a school more than a school? And then my last slide, uh, more than a school is a question that we've taken from Shane. This is what our future thinking looks like. It's a school that is a center of research, a possibility thinking place. It's a place for children to develop their environmental literacy, digital literacies, and a notion of democrat democratic literacies. Um, we think these are sustain these vital uh, new knowledges sustainable for, for the future um, in a post-COVID-19 world, and also the next time children are faced um, with a catastrophic moment in history. Children could be empowered to see environment, the environment and the, the health of the planet differently, to be agents of change through digital literacies and to develop new technologies. Um, and also to develop understanding and responsibility, the democracy and that they can be part of and have their voice heard. So a future COVID-19 world needs us all to explore what is more than a school. But for now, parents can help their children make sense of this moment through stories and discussions. They can help their children feel a sense of connected with a global community that we're all struggling together and we can all find ways to, um, to, to solve the challenges that, that we come across that learning at home is different from learning in school and it can't be the same, that we're trying to make uh, some uh, kind of a, a merged version. Um, I think parents can stop judging themselves or one another and they can use social media for sharing positive stories and acknowledge the struggles because no one really has an answer at this time. And um, I think they can be comfortable that they, they're not replicating school. And instead, they can help their children explore, play and inquire and most importantly, to speak and question and discuss, to develop a love of reading, to be independent. They can listen to Maya Angelou, who says, do your best until you know better, and when you know better, make that your new best. And yet in all this, there remains a very real challenge that there are vulnerable people and um, people from disadvantaged backgrounds who the inequalities and gaps will widen as, this, as schools are shut down. And that's, uh, it plays on my mind as a head teacher and it does for my team. But there really has been a shift for us, an unlearning in many cases about how we can educate children in this new world. And I think there is a reimagining taking place, a hopeful opportunity making about the meaning of relationships in education, the centrality of community in learning and teaching, and a re-emphasis on the interconnect interconnectivity of humans. Um, so that's, that's kind of my reflection on when is a school not a school. I'll hand you over to, um, to Ems. Thank you, James. So as James was saying, one thing that is really important that the school are focusing on is developing habits of minds for young learners. And that's very much what we're about at Enrich. So I'd like to explain a little bit about what University's Enrich project is doing to support both teachers and families at this time. In fact, joining us this week, it's been a very hectic week for Enrich working with teachers. We announced a few days ago that we we're going to do our very first teacher webinars because we can't go into work with teachers face to face in schools. We thought we'd have a go online. We advertised them and within 10 minutes we were oversubscribed. So it's been a fantastic week working with those teachers, people we'd normally see in the classrooms, but we're reaching out and working in different ways. Just to show how busy we are right now, as soon as we realised the school closures were inevitable, we set up a special area at Enrich called Maths at Home. It's advertised on our homepage and it does exactly what it says in the title. 
it's repurposing enriched resources for families. And the graph that you can see there shows the number of people visiting Enrich this time last year and then this year. Now, as Madeline kindly said, Enrich are world leaders in maths education support. And this time last year, on the third Monday in March, over 130,000 people were looking at our resources, which is fantastic. That is a huge figure. Forward winder year, the first day of the lockdowns here, and that figure doubled. Overnight, we welcomed a quarter of a million people to our resources, teachers and parents. So our decision to go with maths at home and organise our resources seemed to be a really good decision. And that audience is worldwide. So wherever you're watching this broadcast, there'll be people near you accessing enriched resources, maybe even in your own household. Um, we have huge audiences in Kenya, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, India. Enrich is a worldwide phenomenon. So we talked about habits of mind and James has mentioned those as well. So what does it look like? So if I show you this diagram, which has a rope model on it on our next slide, there are five strands to the rope because a rope with just single strands has no strength in it at all. And it's the same if the children only have one aspect of their mathematical skills, then they struggle later on with problem solving. So our rote model highlights the five areas, the habits we want to develop. So we want them to know their facts. We also want them to understand their work, two key aspects. But to become mathematicians, to develop habits which are transferable to other areas of the curriculum in their own lives, we want them to be able to explain their ideas to others. We also want them to be flexible. When they hit a problem, sometimes try, try and try again can be a great way to approach a problem. But if you haven't quite got the right strategy to begin with, then that can become very frustrating. So we encourage the children to think about different strategies and to work flexibly. And then the fifth strand that brings it all together, I think is really important for my subject of maths, it's to enjoy what they're doing and to be enjoying it so much that they want to keep coming back to it. So that's what we look for within rich resources. We aim to design resources that every child can get started on and that will stretch them. So we call it a low threshold so they can get started and then a high ceiling to extend their learning. And that's what we've been doing with maths at home. And to recognize some of the challenges that families are facing accessing resources. Not everybody has a tablet or can go online. We've organised them for each year group in four ways. The first way is we've identified resources that can be done with pencil and paper. So many schools are printing those off and sending them home and some families are using the time that they've got on the laptops and computers to prepare them later in the day. Because as James was saying, school life, home life, they're very different and we need to be able to work flexibly. So the resources we provide need to be able to use whatever time of day suits families. So there's pencil and paper resources. We also have an area for each age group called homemade maths, and that's taking ideas and activities that they would normally do in the classroom, but identifying ways they could do it at home with the resources at their hand. So hopefully that makes it very family friendly. We've put some extended tasks in there. Families are telling us that they're dipping in and out of teaching during the day. So what we've done is we've put activities that children can get started on, come back to later, and maybe work on over several days. Again, family-friendly approach. And then there's our interactivities, which Enrich is really well known for. And some recent research we did actually showed they have a significant impact on family engagement. So with our interactivities, Let's have a look at one of them. So the next slide shows a screenshot of, I think my favorite activity on it, it's called Got It. It's a game I used to play as a child and many of you probably know it well. It's a target game. Start at zero, take it in turns to add a small number. And then the winner is the one who adds the number to get to 23. It's low threshold. Most children can get started on it. But the high ceiling, is thinking about a strategy to win. And then when they've worked that out, what the children can then do is go on the settings tab and they can start thinking, I wonder what would happen if I went second instead of 
first. I wonder what would happen if I changed the target number. And I wonder what would happen if I changed the totals that are being added on. So we're developing those habits of being curious, of being creative, those transferable skills that the children can use across the curriculum. And got it is a little example of an activity you do on pencil and paper that the children can using interactivities and a research has shown that this is an activity just like many of the others on Enrich where the children keep coming back to it. I've been told by some of the sisters we've spoken to that they love teaching it to older brothers and sisters because they can beat them at it once they've figured out the strategy. They love teaching it to older members of their families too. One child told me he taught it to his mum and then he went and taught it to his granddad. So the children are engaging with mathematics for an extended period of time. And that's really important to nurture these habits or skills that we value to enrich and are valued by the university primary school as well. So what we're doing to enrich then, we've got the Maths at Home website. We're looking to continue that website during the school term, over the school holidays. And we realise that things will be very different next term and we'll be supporting that as well. And we're also supporting the BBC's Bite Size initiative so that children, wherever they are, can access a daily maths lesson. And we're working closely to identify activities on Enrich that the BBC can use in that initiative as well. So I suppose the best thing to summarise is just to say it's a very exciting time to be at Enrich. And I'm very proud to be the director of a project that is making such a difference to so many children's lives. They may not be able to take their exams at the moment, but what they can do is learn those habits of mind, those transferable skills that will hopefully put them in a very strong position when they can go back to school and continue their normal lives. Thank you. Madeline, over to you. So thank you both very much indeed for those presentations. Um, really thought-provoking uh, insights and some really useful and practical suggestions as to how to improve the homeschooling, particularly around mathematics. Now, we've been getting in a series of questions from all over the world, and I'm going to start uh, putting those questions to our two panelists. Um, Garth, uh, who is uh, an alumnus of Jesus, and uh, Sam, a fellow Gatonian, um, both asking about educational inequalities that have widened potentially during this period and what we do to combat that, whether it is in terms of a school taking back uh, pupils or indeed universities seeking to make good any deficit over these last few months. I wonder whether, um, James, you'd like to start us off on that. Well, um, because safety is the most important consideration at the moment, um, we, we are um, we're considering um, how the most vulnerable children in our school, the most disadvantaged, will be returning to school, and how um, looking at um, the bespoke interventions that are research informed, so we know that they would work, um, and could ident and I through identification of what the need is for those those individual children, uh, to be providing coaching and um, tuition that would happen as part of the school day, but also after the school day. So I think there is definitely an, a requirement for additional support. Um, obviously, there's, there are funding implications in that, and we would be challenging government to, to say that they need to, to support schools in, in being able to do those things. But for us, really, as a school that, is, that uh, aspires to be research-informed, is to go to the university and find out from my colleagues, the academics, and from uh, you know, Ems Lord and, uh, and others, how do we, how do we best um, support the most vulnerable children because of we know what we know works. Because often in schools we just we we try our best and we don't always know whether it's the right strategy for the needs of the, those individuals. To say that they all need the same thing is, is also a kind of, kind of tokenistic and simple way of uh, trying to understand the inequalities that are definitely arising um, during this period of time. Em, so I don't know if you. Em, do yeah. you have a view? I think one project that we've done with Enrich recently has been working with hospital schools. And there's an interesting parallel here because at the moment we've got all the children off. Um, but as James knows, and I found when I've been teaching, there's always one or two children in your class who are missing extended period of education. It could be due to family reasons, 
illness. And we've been working very closely with the hospitals to think what it is we can do to support those children, firstly with gaps in their education, but also they're missing out on those opportunities to collaborate with others and learn those personal skills. So one thing that we've looked at um, is developing collaborative learning skills. I know the university primary schools have been looking at this as well. So when they're teaching, it's very much thinking about the dialogue and the communication. So we encourage the children to do tasks that are collaborative. We will encourage those skills whilst also covering the curriculum. Now, we've done that as a pilot project and we've done that with um, hospital schools. One thing that we're looking at going forward is thinking how can that work and how can that research then inform supporting children going back from working at home where they're by and large by themselves to going back into school and working again with others. So I think what we've learned from the hospital schools will be very good going back into the schools when everyone returns. But hopefully there's also a project there to continue helping those children who are ill or otherwise unwell and unable to go to school now. So maybe that'll be one of the benefits to come out of this, that we'll have a national bank of resources to support those children. That's a really interesting crossover from a very particular situation to something that may have much wider implications. And along that line, we're getting a, a number of questions in from uh, our alumni, including from uh, Wei Xin, who is an alum from Jesus and is uh, in Singapore at the moment and putting his question from Singapore. And that's really about the use of technologies in learning now and whether we have a different view of that as a result of COVID-19 and particularly about blended learning. Is this a transition we are on the cusp of making? Are we ready for it as teachers? Are we ready for it as parents and educators? Enz, would you like to start us off on that one? I think, by the response to our webinars this week, the teachers and the schools are very ready for it and they've made huge efforts to make sure the lessons continue. What we have a huge issue with is ensuring that everybody at home has access to the resources they need to do the online lessons. So an example is I know a local school was very proactive and got in touch with families before the closures and said, OK, what have you got? Have you got broadband? Do you have a laptop? And they found out the numbers that had those. But then, of course, now we realise there may be more than one child in the family. And if there is a laptop, there could be two or three adults trying to use them to work from home and the children trying to use them. And there's issues with bandwidth. So I think looking at that aspect is another way forward to support children, and make sure everybody has access to high quality education. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I agree, Emma. One of one of our um, one of our parents said they they've got they have three children. They have an iPhone um, and a laptop that they have to work on. So the children are trying to work on the iPhone uh, with the things we're we're doing. But in terms of is this the way forward? I think there's a transition period of blended learning where you know, our intention, you know, as 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 we move into the next term, is to ha is to have children um, returning to school but maybe as a part-time and having blended digital um, resources for them to do at home. But what is consistent with the messages coming from parents and um, from my, my team um, is that this sense of disconnection and lack of relationship and community making is causing more hurt and, and loss than whether they've done an English lesson or a maths lesson on a certain day. Um, and you know, parents are kind of yearning for that to come back, and I know the children are as well. So while we're on that, uh, to that point, we've got a question here. Forgive me, I just need to flick the screen uh, on this um, about how can we measure those more intangible aspects of in-person uh, interaction in the classroom, outside the classroom, but still within the school setting, which instinctively many people feel are missing in the homeschooling environment, uh, but are important to the development of the pupil or student. Do we have any research on that? Do we have any ways of measuring that? Um, and I, I, It's Tess uh, who asked this question. She's an alumnus uh, from Clare. Well, James. Um 
In our school, we, we have five values that guide our work of empathy, respect, trust, courage, and gratitude. Um, and there isn't the old adage that, that you, you test what you value, you assess what you most value. So we're, we're constantly exploring how do we value somebody's empath, empath, empathetic, empath, empathy skills or their ability to be courageous. Um, it's very challenging, I think, because they are sometimes um, not as tangible as whether they've got the answers right or wrong or they can write a, a narrative. So you know, we're, we're looking at uh, kind of research from the Jubilee Centre in Birmingham, for example, um, and working uh, who, who, who look at uh, character um, education and values and kind of moral ethic, ethical education to see whether there are frameworks to, to indeed assess those kind of things. Um, but um, you know, in terms of our, our own team, we created a, a people strategy that that looks at how the adults are um, being the examples and models of those values so that children can learn from that. But how we assess it is yet is, is a complex because it's, it's, you can't do a test about it whether you're courageous or not. <laughs> Certainly not <laughs> normally <laughs> within, <laughs> within, the, within the regulations of a national government, probably not, no. Uh, Ems, no. do you have any view on that? It's been an area that we've been actively exploring. So I was really ple pleased that Tess asked this question. Yep, we encourage children to be creative, to be curious, but how do you go about managing that? How do you know they're improving and what does it look like? So we've done some projects where we've worked with schools on this and actually explored, if you're being curious, what needs to be happening first? So getting the children engaged, asking questions, talking about what they noticed, We've worked with schools on this and we've developed some curiosity scales. We've looked at resilience because we can say to them, try, try, try again, but actually getting them to understand the problem in the first place, have a first attempt, know what to do when they get stuck. We've developed scales working with schools and children are sticking in their books. Teachers have been using them with classes. So the children can see where they're up to, how resilient they're being and identify next steps. And with collaborative learning, we've also run some focus groups where we've been asking the children after one of the tasks, how do you think you got on with that? And I'm sure James will know there will be some children who put their hands up straight away and say they're five out of five at collaborative learning. And as a teacher, you might think mm, they might have one or two more things to learn yet. And there's others who will say, oh, I think I'll give myself a three or a four out of five. And I'll explain why maybe they didn't listen to their friend or they could have tried another approach that someone said. So we try to get the children involved in reflecting on their learning. And by developing some scales, that helps the children identify their next steps as well and also recognise the progress that they're making. Because I think that's very important as well, just to stop and think about how well they're doing. And this week with the teacher webinars, the rote model I showed um, during the presentation the team have developed our own version of it, a child friendly one, that children can start to fill in and think how resilient they're being, how many times they're working flexibly. So getting the children involved as much as possible with that, I think is really important. And, and Madeline, I, I'm sorry, sorry. I, we have a follow up question, which I, I think is uh, very pertinent to that last point from Ems, which is on this um, collaboration and dialogue between pupils or students. Have either of you seen really outstanding and compelling examples of how to do that online and remotely? Or is this really only possible in the in-person situation in the classroom? This is from Lucy, an alumna from Christ. So to, yeah, to answer Lucy, at, at, at our university um, and the Faculty of Education has, has contributed groundbreaking research. Neil Mercer, Professor Neil Mercer's work, Rupert Wegriff's work, um, and, and, and others, Louis Major, they've, they've contributed a huge um, Routledge uh, international uh, guide about oracy and dialogue and how digital literacies and digital oracy and dialogue can be developed. Um, so I, I'd really recommend you to, to search for, for you know, Mercer and Wegriff and Major's work um, at this university. Um, so there is lots out there. What we're trying to do in our school is how do we translate that um, robust research into the, the practicalities of a primary school? Um, and it, it, you know, a bit like Newton again, having this space is giving us, although we're doing online learning and all the other things that, that are trying to engage with young people um, in their 
living rooms and, and, and homes. Uh, we're trying to really um, develop our, our kind of understanding of that, that kind of evidence and research. So, so thank you for those answers. Now, we've been looking at some really positive aspects, potentially, of online learning, remote uh, collaboration and so on. Um, but we've got a question here from Becky, who is a graduate uh, from Homerton uh, here in the UK. Um, looking at the other side of the coin, what do we do in the home with our children, whatever age, who are not engaging with the remote learning or the online learning that is being set? And how do we get them motivated to complete the, these tasks without this turning into something that's very negative and sets up a no doubt, a, a very bad vibe in the family relationships. Ems, you're, you're excellent at motivating children, motivating uh, to, children. to learn yeah. mathematics, yeah. which is probably one of the hardest of all the tasks. Perhaps you'd like to go first on this one. Well, I think Amrich were incredibly lucky with the team of educators who work on the project. And what they've done is they've started recording videos, just short two or three media, minute video clips of some of our activities so that parents, carers, grandparents can watch those videos, see how to do the activities, and then sit down with youngsters at home, enjoy them together. So it doesn't even have to be introduced as a maths activity. In fact, it's fair to say a lot of people can look at an enriched activity and initially not even see where the maths is because we design very engaging activities which use the mathematical skills, but it might not be apparent. So we've got a lovely example called Frogs, and you can imagine frogs on lily pads facing each other and you're trying to get them from one side to the other. It's a lovely problem solving activity. It can be set up as a family game. And the video that we've put online, parents models different approaches, how to go about it, what to look for. And there's some guidance notes as well. So sometimes, I mean, I love my subject, but sometimes mentioning maths straight off might not be the way in. But having an engaging game and understanding how to bring the mathematics out, maybe that would be a nice way forward to consider as well. It reminds it reminds me of it reminds me Em, of a of a a story that somebody told me yesterday actually that um, their neighbour um, has a six year old child um, and she she's very independent and she says things like I'm going to go upstairs now and the parents say how many steps do you think that will take how many jumps will it take. Um, go you, you you have a guess go and work it out and then come back and tell us so they, they are constantly asking very small questions that are building a sense of uh, spatial awareness and understanding um, but I, one of the things I was going to add is um, my own uh, PhD research was about looking at learning in the family home um, and what I what I found and, and others sound like Mandy Swan from the Faculty of Education is that we don't really know what it looks like at home, because there's no real definition of home, um, because they're all so different. And so the, the notion I came up with, diverse creativities in the home, uh, indicated that we, as teachers and educators, we need to help children bring their home into school, rather than always trying to put school into the home. So we all know that in primary, in primary um, education, homework, doesn't, there's, there's not huge evidence that says it, it raises st standards. Um, it, it actually, Sunday night is where the tension in the family arises because everyone has to do the homework before Monday. Um, so this is like an extended version of Sunday night and it's very difficult. So um, I learned so much more from, going, from visiting children's homes and sitting with them and seeing what they did. It was much richer what they were doing with Lego and woodwork than I would ever imagine a worksheet from school would ever uh, provide. So, so thank so my, you for that. Would be find out what goes on in children's homes and help bring it into school eventually when we can. <laughs> that sounds really exciting. Um, now we've spoken quite a bit uh, so far about parents and the home uh, schooling environment, but we have a question here also from Helen, uh, who's a graduate uh, from Clare College, and she's uh, put this question to us from the USA. And that is, how can teachers be better supported to work with primary students in these online learning situations? Both of you founding fellows of the Chartered College of Teaching. I wonder what your response is to that question. Uh, perhaps, uh, Ems, would you like to go first? Again, it's an excellent question. And Enrich, our main role has always been supporting teachers. 
So from the point of view of our activities, we always provide teacher notes to give an idea of how maybe to start the activity in key questions. And we collect um, solutions from students, which can be useful for modeling in class or as starting points or for if the children get stuck. But with moving to online, certainly it's very different approaches needed, a lot more flexibility is needed. I think the other issue at the moment is when the schools go back, it's not going to be easy for teachers to go out and get extra support and attend the normal PD. So I think part of the responsibility we have to enrich uh, supporting teachers is to think again about our support and offering webinars, offering newsletters that are sent out electronically so the teachers can get them in their homes, making sure that we have opportunities for teachers to talk to us and reaching out, so using social media to see what it is they're using and how it's going. I think it's very much that two-way discussion with the teachers. James, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think I, mean, I was I've been I've been astounded by the the creativity and the imagination of of the teachers in my team. But um, I know people like Dame Alison Peacock, who's the the CEO of the Charter College of Teaching, who has a much broader understanding of. Of, of colleagues around the UK and, and further afield saying that th this time teachers have and teaching assistants and, and everyone who works in schools have really embraced opportunities to find ways through for every child using technology. But I think what may have arisen is that um, despite the kind of roll your sleeves up and get on with it, we, we haven't attended enough to um, providing the right kind of professional development in schools for um, Kind of this blended approach, because I think there could be some really exciting things that come forward out of this. Um, and I think, as Em said, uh, you know, finding opportunities for professional learning that really um, kind of adds foundations to the creativity that has arisen from teachers would be really beneficial. So, how do we take the positive changes, the positive uh, creative developments that we've seen in this period? and make sure that they continue into the future. We have a, a number of questions around that. Are we going to go back to the narrow constraints of the curriculum, which uh, uh, James, you very eloquently said you were trying to escape from in your school, or, or is there a way that we can seize these improvements and embed them? What do you think? James. So, so I, sorry, Madeleine, I missed that last bit of your question. So do you think, and if so, how, should we take these positive changes that we've seen, this creative uh, burst of, of blended learning and so on, um, are we going to be able to seize those things and embed them into school and schooling into the future, or are we going to revert to the rather narrow and standardised curriculum that we had in the past? I mean, I think we have to be bold and take the initiative in a, in a context where governments are trying to work out their, the best approach for the countries that, that we all live in. Um, and you know, there, there, there's critique about all those decisions. Um, but in that space where governments are trying to work out that, you know, the people on the ground, the professionals, and that's why the, Ch the Charter College of Teaching is, a is now here in the UK, um, is for us to say that we have a professional capital as teachers. We understand young people, we understand how to engage young people and to motivate them. And we need, we need, we need accountability, but we need the right kind of accountability that, that actually unleashes the possibilities rather than an accountability system, which in the UK tends to oppress people to be creative. Um, and that's what, you know, I think we have an opportunity to be bold and state what is important for us as a profession, um, because we want, you know, we all want the very best for children. And it's unfortunate that headlines say things like um, there's a lost generation of children or, you know, you know, it's fine, you know, um, take the rest of the year off because it implies that teachers are sitting at home um, in their hammocks waiting for the governments to let us go back to school again. You know, my school has never shut. No schools I know have shut. They've remained open for key workers. So um, I think we need to be bold and articulate. We need to articulate better why it's important that we have a we have a, we have professional knowledge we have professional capital we can seize this opportunity it's not easy though madeline that's for sure i think that's right ems what was your view on that 
Well, James was touching on the assessment system, and I, I think that's a very good point to look at. We have an assessment system that focuses on one aspect of those five strands I was talking about. It talks, it focuses very heavily on procedural knowledge. But we know from the um, worldwide um, global trends in education that what the children need going forward to thrive will be problem solving skills and collaborative skills. So maybe this is the opportunity that we need to go back and look at how we're assessing the children and are we assessing the skills that they need. So yes, they need some facts, they need that basic knowledge so they can apply it, but how much are we actually considering things like how well they work with one another, what their attitudes are, how resilient they are, and how well they collaborate? Because those are the skills they're going to need because the world is adapting and changing so quickly right now that having some knowledge is good, but having those habits of mind, that will make them thrive. And if we have an assessment system that values them, just as much as James, his team, Enrich, as much as we value them, I think then we're in a, re a really good position to go forwards. But I think it's the assessment system that we need to look at. I agree, Ems. I mean, you know, the, the, in the UK, we have a times table test that happens in year four. And, and Ems will know the rich evidence that maths anxiety um, actually can cripple young people from, con from continuing their maths education. When you have an assessment tool that gives children 10 seconds or whatever it may be to answer a, a rapid fire question and navigate the, 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 the digital um, iPad to be able to answer that question, it's not really helping us as teachers assess whether children have the times table knowledge, which we can do that in many other ways and still be held to account and robust and all those other things. But the way um, governments often do it is not attending to the research that Emmons will know fully about. So I would like to, to end with uh, a question from Carlos, who uh, was uh, as an alum from Churchill and sends us this question from Mexico. So would you say, either of you or both of you, that the most important lessons that we learn in school is not actually about skills and skilling, but about how to be and become as an individual. Um, well, I think I would I would agree with Carlos in many ways. I think there's with schools, um, you know, we teach knowledge and we teach skills, but we all we also teach in our school, how to be a compassionate citizen. So how do we in interact in a community that can support one another, that can challenge one another in, you know, in respectful, polite ways, and um, can disagree together. Um, and, you know, in a school where we have, we'll eventually have 600 children here, in a school that's a big community, um, where there's lots of um, conflict of ideas and conflicts of opinion. Um, so I, I, I would agree, Ems, with, with Carlos, that schools, as Shane, the child in my school, says, "What schools are more? Uh, what's more than a school? It's not just a place for, you know, teaching English and maths. It's all, which is vital and important. It's also uh, much more complex and about being." Ems, would you agree with that, or would you still think that there is a very important role for skills and skilling? I think I would agree with James. Uh, when you're in school, it's an opportunity to build your strengths but also to address your weaknesses um, and that means it's very much about the individual because we all have different skills and different areas to develop but once we've developed those and we've learned to use them well with others then we can make a really great contribution to our society so i think the individual is incredibly important and that comes back to the assessment system looking at how we consider those and we value them is very important and we don't want to lose that because at the moment individuals are coming out so strongly with this blended learning that we have with the schools and the homes so Carlos thank you very much for such a fascinating question and I'm afraid that that completes the time that we have for questions I'd like to thank all our alumni for putting those questions through to us and I apologize for those of you we haven't had time actually to, to take the questions into the panel discussion but thank you all very much indeed for participating and engaging today I would like once again to thank our two speakers and to invite you uh, 
uh, to join us this uh, join us on June the 18th for the fourth Cambridge conversation, which is at 3 p.m. at British Summertime. And the topic for that will be COVID-19 and its impact on mental health, in particularly the mental health of young people. One final point, if I may, before I go, and that's another thank you. That's a thank you to all of you, our alumni, who have so generously donated to the university's COVID-19 research fund, or indeed to the student hardship funds, either in the university or in your colleges. If I may say so as a head of house, we are enormously grateful for those donations and they are making a great difference to the lives and indeed to the uh, sense of, of performance and the sense of calm um, of our students. So thank you very much indeed for that. That completes uh, today's Cambridge conversation and it remains for me to wish you all uh, our very best here from Cambridge. Uh, keep safe and well until this time next week, not only of course yourselves, but also your friends and families. So that's goodbye.